Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to Spec Sorter Prep's webinar on BPA and phthalates in consumer products. I'm Peter Esco, Marketing and Communications Manager here at Spec Sorter Prep, and I'll be moderating today. Before we begin, I'd like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. First off, everyone who registered for the webinar will be sent a copy of the presentation slides. The webinar is being recorded, and we will post it on, YouTube, and our, on our YouTube channel so that you can watch it at your convenience. We'll upload it there in about a week or so, and you'll be, you will receive a follow-up email with the link when we do uh, post it. Any questions you may have will be answer, answered at the end during our Q&A session, so just simply type them into the question box as you think of them, and at the end, we'll answer as many as we can. Be sure to hang around after the Q&A session, because we're raffling off the cool guests. With that out of the way, let's get on with today's presentation. I would like to introduce Patricia Atkins. Patty is our Applications Specialist and has worked on a number of research projects here that you may have already seen, including our Toxic Metals in Pet Food and the Chemical Gourmet, a webinar series on the chemistry of chocolate, salt, and other gourmet foods. She presented a poster at PITCOM last month on the presence of trace metals in lipstick, and we'll be publishing it as a white paper later on in the year. Patty, Patty I'll pass it off to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Spec Serta Prep's uh, webinar on BPA and phthalates and consumer products. Uh, one of the reasons that we're studying BPA and phthalates and then BPA and phthalates is a concern is because BPA and phthalates has been a very hot topic over the past, I'd say, five or so years. Uh, there has been a lot of concern of BPA and phthalates causing health effects in children. Uh, and we've seen a lot of new legislation over the last two years or 18 months come into effect uh, regulating BPA and other, um, other phthalates like uh, DEHP. We're going to go and start with a little bit of background on these particular uh, groups of chemicals. And then I'm also going to discuss some of the regulations that have been enacted around the world. I'm going to continue on with some of the methods and testing methods for these particular compounds. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, Spex's own research with BPA and phthalate. Uh, we have several BPA phthalate research projects that we've done in the past um, on consumer uh, water sources like water, uh, bottled water, uh, tap water, laboratory water, and uh, things like sports bottles and drink bottles. To begin with, I want to start with phthalate. They're a group of esters of uh, benzene bicarboxylic bicar acids, and they've actually been in production since the late 1800s. Around uh, the 1920s, they went into some full-scale commercial use as plastic additives when they phased out the use of camphor as plastic additives. Phthalates are in use for most plastic compounds, and they can be composed from 10 to 60 percent by weight of that plastic compound. Uh, they're used as binders, coatings, fragrances, pigments. There's a, a very long list of what phthalates can be used for, and it's actually very difficult to find uh, plastic products that don't have some form of phthalate in them. The major concern is the health effect of all these phthalates. The residue is uh, really widespread around the world. Uh, phthalates have been found in indoor air. They've been found in dust, wastewater runoff, um, you know, waste streams, uh, carpeting, you name it, and basically phthalate residue has been found in it. The concern is what kind of health effects do these particular phthalates cause? There is some literature to suggest that uh, things like asthma, diabetes, obesity, um, different reproductive disorders, and genetic effects are all caused uh, as health effects by uh, this endocrine disruptive endocrine disruptor. Excuse me. In response to that, the U.S. has started to control the use of phthalates, in particular DEHP, butyl benzyl phthalate, and dibutyl, uh, dibutyl phthalate in uh, children's toys starting around 2009. Uh, Mexico, the EU, and Japan have also restricted or banned phthalates in children's toys. So where do we find phthalates? As you can see, there's a very long list of products which phthalates are uh, in common use. Um, some of the more well-known products are things like children's toys, water bottles, bottled water, cosmetics, but there are also some surprising uses of phthalates. Uh, we have things like baby care lotions and ointments which have phthalates in them, air fresheners. Any air fresheners or perfumes usually have some form of phthalates in them. And we have things like vinyl flooring, 
And another surprising one is medical tubing and devices. So things such like IV bags and IV lines and, and medical devices which are placed in the body. There's some concern there that there's a migration of phthalates from these particular medical uh, devices into the human body. Here's a list of um, some common phthalates. The ones that are in bold are the ones currently under scrutiny by um, most of the regulations around the world. If we look at some of the regulations about banned and regulated phthalates, um, we have regulations here from the US, the EU, and Japan. Primarily, we're talking about six phthalates, and they're listed here at the top. They're acronyms that are listed at the top. They're basically grouped into two groups. The first group, which is the, the DEHP, the dibutyl phthalate, and the benzyl butyl phthalate, are uh, a group of banned or restricted phthalates for all child care articles and toys. And child care articles are things like pacifiers, bottles, uh, things that come into contact with infants and children. The other group, these higher weight molecular weight phthalates, are only really controlled for toys and child care articles that are intended for oral contact with a child. So things that are meant to be placed in the mouth or things that potentially children can put in their mouth. Now, the EU, Japan, and the US have very similar uh, regulations when it comes to the restriction of these particular phthalates with uh, one or two little differences. The biggest difference being in the US, the 0.1% is actually limited for each individual phthalate. And while the EU and the Japanese directives uh, call for a 0.1% combined ban of these particular phthalates. The second group of compounds, or the second compound we're going to look at, is bisphenol A. And it's uh, two phenyl groups, and it's produced by condensing acetone and phenol uh, with an acid catalyst, usually HCl. And about 4 million metric tons are produced a year. That was first reported in 1891. So it's been in, in our consumer use and in our consumer products for just about 100 years. It's found in polymers, toys, medical devices, and most important for most consumers, it's found in coatings and epoxy resins for things like jars and can liners. Again, the health effects are, it's an endocrine disruptor, and there's been suggested uh, health effects since the 1930s. So since the first papers were published in the 1930s suggesting possible endocrine effects, um, we've known that there is potentially concern for bisphenol A. And there are no clear regulations uh, right now. At least in the US, there is no law for bisphenol A. But there are some guidelines. The EPA has a guideline of 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day as an exposure. But there's been some uh, recent studies that suggest that levels as low as 0.025 micrograms per kilogram can, date, can have an adverse effect. And here is a fairly extensive list of all the different places you can find uh, BPA. Um, some of the more surprising places you can find BPA are dental filling material. So if you have a dental filling that is a tooth colored dental filling, it could be a very high percentage of BPA. I've seen numbers quoted as much as 60 to 80 percent of BPA could be in a dental filling. And not all dental fillings do have BPA. Another surprising uh, finding was uh, thermal cash register receipts. It's just within the past year been reported that thermal cash register receipts have free BPA coatings on them to keep the cash register receipts from sticking together. Um, it's a, an effort to make them glide either. They don't stick together. And it, these are found in the, the chemical and thermal transfer papers that most people get when they uh, purchase something at a store. And for most people, the, the contact that you get on a daily basis with BPA comes from things like your food can linings. Things like soda and tomatoes and other acidic foods are of particular concern because the acid is known to leach the BPA from the, from the lining of the cans. Another couple of... Uh, surprising places for a BPA is uh, some recycled pizza boxes have linings of a, a, a epoxy coating of this uh, BPA. And there was a recent study that found BPA residue in toilet paper. And to some people's dismay, beer and wine, even if they're in glass bottles, can have um, BPA in the, in the beer and the wine if they're fermented in BPA lined vats. If we look at some of the international regulations for BPA, they're all fairly new. They've all come out within the, the last 18 months or so. 
the EU has a food packaging um, um, migration limit of 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, which is a limit. They also have a to tolerable daily intake level of 0.05 ppm per day per individual. And they have suggested the ban of polycarbonate baby bottles that contain BPA. And that ban was enacted uh, just this past March. In Canada, we also have uh, polycarbonate baby bottles that have been banned as of last March. And recently, um, Canada deemed BPA to be toxic. This allows uh, more discussions for actions of what will be done next to control or, or eliminate BPA from many products. In Denmark, there's actually a temporary ban on polycarbonate baby bottles containing BPA. Now, for the U.S., there is no one regulation for BPA. We have uh, many regulations, and they're broken down by state. Different states can enact different types of leg legislation when it comes to BPA. I've highlighted a few just to kind of show you the, the scope of the different legislation. Um, a state like Maryland has only banned empty food and beverage containers that are in use for children under the age of four years old. So that means things like bottles and pacifiers and uh, sippy cups and things that are intended for children under four years old. Uh, these products cannot have BPA. And this is actually due to be enacted in 2012. Um, a place like uh, Minnesota has actually banned, again, empty food and beverage or reusable food and beverage containers for children under the age of three. And the manufacturer of these products was, was to stop in 2010, but these products still could be uh, put up for sale until 2012. Uh, Washington State, again, has uh, banned empty food and beverage containers for children under three years old. Uh, and they have also put in for next year a ban on sports water bottles under 64 ounces that contain BPA. Some of these uh, states have enacted bans on empty or reusable containers, and that's it. That they, does, this law then does not apply to things that are already pre-filled, like uh, jars of baby food or cans of baby formula. Some states have enacted, like Vermont, Pre-filled metal cans containing infant formula or baby food have been banned. And this effect is supposed to set to effect of July 2014. The most common method, if we go back to phthalates for testing phthalates, comes from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This particular method, the standard operating procedure for the determination of phthalates, is based on uh, the use for children's toys and child care articles. And just to give you an overview of what this method entails, it measures the six restricted phthalates. And there are three components to this method. There's the sample preparation component, the extraction component, and then, of course, the analysis component. If we look at the sample preparation, the toy itself has to be cut into pieces less than two millimeters in diameter. Or they can be ground to a fine powder. Uh, at specs, when we test toys, we uh, use the specs sample prep freezer mill to grind our toys to a fine powder. And then you're to prepare your standards or your QC samples. Uh, we use our SPECS Certi Prep phthalate standards, and we have a SPECS uh, Certi Prep phthalates in polyethylene QC standard, which is a, uh, a powdered polyethylene standard with phthalates impregnated in it. For the extraction, there are a lot of acceptable methods for extraction, and there is a list of of extracting extraction methods um, by the Consumer Product Safety Commission method, and they reference the different EPA methods for those particular extraction procedures. You have SOXLIT, the pressurized fluid extraction, the ultrasonic extraction, and the microwave extraction. When uh, we do our testing here at SPECS, we use a microwave method. Uh, this is how we uh, test our, our QC samples for our polyethylene and phthalate uh, standard. And I've just given a little snapshot of our microwave method because we've actually been asked for it by some customers. Um, we use about a gram of sample in 25 mils of an organic solvent, acetone and cyclohexane mix. Uh, we keep it heated to about 110 to 140 degrees C. And our reflux time for this particular microwave method is about 10 minutes. And if we look at our analysis, this happens to be our phthalate standard with an internal standard mixed in. We do GCMS analysis in our scan range, and we scan from about 50 to 450 mass units, and we're using a CV5 column here. 
Another method for uh, phthalate testing is for the use of testing of municipal and industrial wastewater. This is EPA method 606. This method measures a slightly different combination of phthalates. We do have some of the banned phthalates, the DEHP and the BBP and the DBP, but we also have some of the smaller uh, phthalates like the diethyl phthalate and the dimethyl phthalate. Uh, this method calls for a traditional liquid-liquid extraction and concentration and analysis by GCMS. We're looking at testing methods for BPA. Uh, there are some testing methods. Most of them are by the ASTM. The ASTM D706506 is the test method for different alkyl phenols, uh, including bisphenol A, for environmental water samples by GCMS. It uses a solid phase extraction and then a GCMS analysis. They also have an LCMS method, which is ASTM D757409, and that's determination of bisphenol A in environmental waters by LCMS. When I was looking for some other studies that involve uh, BPA and phthalates, I came across some very interesting findings, or some very interesting studies that uh, occurred in, in 2010 and 2011. One particular study was looking at the presence of phthalates in contact lens and cleaning solutions. They did confirm the presence of different phthalates in the contact lens cleaning solutions, and when they looked at the actual migration from contact lenses, they did find migration of DBP and BBP from the contact lenses, and those are two of the, the controlled phthalates. Another place that they looked for phthalates was uh, in fruit jellies, and they used a dispersive SPE and LCMS. And again, they looked for uh, a common group of, of phthalates, and they found the butylbenzyl phthalate and the diethyl phthalate in real uh, fruit jelly samples. For BB, or excuse me, for BPA, there actually were a couple of uh, very noteworthy uh, studies within the last year. Uh, one I alluded to before was the transfer of bisphenol A from thermal printer paper to the skin. Uh, this study showed that thermal, thermal paper contained between 8 and 17 grams per kilogram of bisphenol A. And that handling this paper for five seconds could give you about one microgram of BPA, between the range of 0.2 to 6 micrograms. And then if your hands were wet or greasy, you had lotion on them, you could absorb up to 10 times more of the BPA onto your skin. And they found that this BPA that was on the skin was extractable after two hours. So this was uh, showing them that even though they didn't know if the, the BPA passed through the skin, it was going to a sufficient depth enough that it couldn't be washed off. Another interesting study was uh, bisphenol A in indoor dust from here in the eastern United States. BPA was found in 95% of the samples collected in the range of 0.5 to 10,000 nanograms per gram. And it was, they suggested the median intake of the ingestion of this BPA dust was between 0.3 and 5.6 nanograms per kilogram of body weight a day. Here at Specs, we have a, a few studies we've done on phthalates and BPA. We looked at all the different laboratory water sources, uh, things like our, our DI water system, bottled water, and we examined them for BPA and phthalates. We also looked at bottled water, the type of water you'd buy at your grocery store or you would buy out of the vending machine. And we had heard uh, different theories that you know, heated water, water that was left in a car during the summer, was actually had more phthalate contamination and migration than if it was kept at room temperature. And that's why you should never leave a water bottle or a bottle of water in your car. So we wanted to test that theory. We wanted to see if there was any validity to it. We also looked at consumer water sources, uh, things like our municipal tap water and our water cooler system here at Bex Certiprep. And finally, we wanted to know about sports bottles and other reusable beverage containers. Uh, there has been some talk of that you shouldn't drink bottled water, but you should be using a reusable container. So we wanted to test that theory. Would these uh, sports bottles actually have lower contaminant levels? Um, and what would happen when these uh, bottles were washed? There has been some literature suggesting that, that possibly the more the bottle is washed and it breaks down or if exposed to heat, that more phthalates migrate from the plastic into the water. And then for 2011, we are planning an upcoming study that we're working on right now that I alluded to before, that BPA and for BPA and phthalates in small toys. 
when we're talking about water, which most of our studies are, are around water, um, we first want to talk about water quality. In the U.S., municipal water quality is controlled by the EPA. Uh, many of these compounds, including the phthalates and the BPA, are strictly controlled by the EPA, and there are, are extensive guidelines on what can be in your, in your water, your municipal water sources. For bottled water, however, that's controlled by the FDA. It's considered a food product. And currently, as the last time I, I checked uh, not too long ago, there are no steadfast regulations for BPA and phthalate, but there are some discussion and reviews, and there are some recommendations uh, coming out. Around the world, many people believe that bottled water is just a safer alternative to municipal water sources, and that's something we wanted to look at. Bottled water has become a very large industry. It's suggested that by 2012, by the water industry, that, they, that the market will be $168 billion a year in sales. And the U.S. alone consumes almost 9 billion gallons of, of bottled water a year. And it's the second largest consumed beverage in the country. Americans, when they're asked why they drink bottled water, they generally give two answers, that they're either substituting water for other beverages that they con consider to be less healthy, or they have concerns over their, uh, the safety of their tap water. It's kind of a, a funny side note that uh, many bottled water companies, especially in the U.S., um, have many sources for their bottled water, and some of those sources happen to be municipal water sources. So what contributes to the contamination of the water sources? Are the, are the contaminants um, because of processing and manufacture, or are they because of transport? Well, there are a lot of sources, many potential sources for contamination and pollutants in our water supplies, both bottled water and municipal water. We have the potential for environmental contamination and any manufacturing or processing that that water goes through, whether it's municipal water going through a treatment facility or whether it's bottled water going through some sort of a treatment facility at the, the bottling plant. And you have the packaging of the transport, so the actual uh, pumping of water from uh, one location to another, or the actual bottling and, and packaging of the, of the bottled water. And then, of course, uh, any uh, distribution contamination. So does the processing water increase BPA and phthalates? That was one of the questions we wanted to answer. We also wanted to figure out if bottled water is more highly processed than municipal water, would it actually have more contaminants in it? And then there's been a, a concern is the leaching of chemicals happening from the packaging, that whole concern that uh, water over time will start to leach the phthalates from the, from the bottled water packaging or the heat would cause bottled water to have a higher concentration of phthalates. We've seen a lot of suggestions, like don't you reuse a disposable water bottle, that once you finish your, your bottled water, you need to throw the bottle out and not reuse it. Um, we also have been told not to expose the bottled water or your water bottles to high temperatures. Mm -hmm. And some people just suggest you avoid bottled water altogether. So here are some of the, the sources and the containers that we've looked at. Um, for our reusable beverage and water containers, we had BPA-free sports bottles, so your traditional uh, shaped sports bottle, but it was uh, considered to be BPA-free. We had a traditional polycarbonate sports bottle. We had a plastic jug type container, which sort of looked like a, a regular plastic water bottle or some sort of uh, fruit or milk uh, jug that you would take out of the refrigerator of a, of a kind of a hard plastic. Uh, and we had a Teflon bottle, because there has been some, um, some companies that are selling Teflon bottles as the answer to uh, phthalate and BPA contamination. Squeeze bottle. It must. It was a, a PVC type base bottle with a softener in it to make it a squeeze type bottle. For our consumer water sources, we had commercial bottled water, things like you would get in your supermarket or out of your out of your vending machine. We had filtered point of use water systems, and all that means was your typical kind of water coolers. Uh, here at Specs, we had two different types of water coolers, and I'll discuss those in a minute. For our laboratory water samples, we looked at four different sources of laboratory water. We had bottled HPLC grade water. We had bottled LCMS grade water. We had uh, DI water from our DI processing source, and this is our, our DI processing uh, center. And this water had been decanted into a HDP carboy, and so the several gallons of this water would be deposited at one time, and then this bottle would sit for an indefinite period of time for lab use. 
And then we also had a tap that was directly connected to this primary DI water source. One of the first things we had to do when investigating phthalates was to really take a hard look at our laboratory and the materials that we were going to use for the experiment. We wanted to know what the baseline phthalate contamination was that we were working with, especially in our reagents and our solvents. And there is widespread phthalate exposure. You have the plastic containers that you see here um, with our reagents and our chemicals in them that have potential phthalates. You have gloves, you have dust, and you have the reagent packaging. Even the glass bottles have plastic caps, uh, seals, and sepsis. Excuse me one second. Then you also have the process uh, contamination, manufacturing contamination. Very difficult to eliminate phthalates completely from your samples. And you really need to test all the materials you're going to use in the experiment before they're put to your experimental use. We have found that rinsing or baking Cleaning our materials whenever possible did reduce our phthalate contamination. I'm going to give you a little example of some of the cleaning and the results of our cleaning of our materials. We used three uh, solids in this particular experiment. We used sodium hydroxide, sodium chloride, and sodium sulfate. And we rinsed these three solid materials before our use with aliquots of methylene chloride. These aliquots were then evaporated down and run by GCMS. We then took the same solids and baked them at 210 degrees C for about 10 to 30 minutes. We let them dry and uh, we rinsed two more aliquots of methylene chloride and reduced those each down for analysis. Then we looked at the pre-cleaning and the post-cleaning and baking uh, regimen and we wanted to see if we were actually reducing our phthalate levels. We did find a fairly good reduction of phthalate levels on uh, two of our compounds. The third compound, the sodium hydroxide, actually did not contain any phthalates or BPI. And if we take a look at uh, our results, if we look at the um, sodium sulfate, the first uh, rinse from the sodium sulfate had just under 200 ppb of total phthalates. The second rinse had cut that uh, number down to about a third. And the third and fourth rinses were almost undetectable. Sodium chloride was a little different story. Our very first rinse had 1,400 ppb of phthalates in the, in the very first aliquot. The second aliquot showed a reduction to about 1,200. And then after baking, the third and fourth rinses were basically undetectable. After we had our reagents and materials clean, we prepared our standards. And here is a list of the different uh, spec standards that we use to test for BPA and phthalates. Now I'm going to move on to our, our collection methods. Our water sample collection methods were used for the laboratory and the municipal water samples. And we aliquoted about 500 mils of water for each of these sources. Now our DI water system and our point of use system uh, were taken at two different points in time. We wanted to see uh, if the, the system had a different level of phthalates that had been sitting for an extended period of time. So we have samples taken from a stationary system, system or a static system. So this system was basically sitting all night without any use. And first thing in the morning, uh, about 12 hours after we had left the building, uh, we had our chemists come in and take the very first samples of the morning from our system. And we had the flush system. This was uh, taken either several hours later in the day or after several liters of water had been flushed through the system. And our two point of use dispensing systems for our, uh, our own consumer use in the building were two point of view systems. They're office coolers, basically. One point of view system was just a dispensing system. There was no filter and no sanitization. So it was just dispensing from the municipal water lines. The second system had a UV sanitization system and a carbon fiber filter. For our reusable bottles, we had a several different kinds of reusable bottles. And we took 500 mils of LCMS water, and we rinsed out these bottles with this 500 mils of water. And we took that as a retain. We wanted to find out what the surface level of an unwashed bottle had. So we took this first 500 uh, mils of water, and we retained it as an unrinsed sample. We then took the bottles and put them in a traditional you know, regular dishwasher. 
We used hot water and dish detergent, and we cleaned the bottles like most of us would clean our personal sports bottles at home. When they came back to the lab, they were rinsed several times with DI water just to kind of clean out any soap residue that might be in them. And then finally, they were rinsed twice with LCMS water before they were finally decanted into with 500 mils of the LCMS water. And the LCMS water had been fully quantified uh, before its use in these bottles. We then tried to simulate the conditions of heated and room temperature samples. We took one set of identical bottles and put them in an oven at 60 degrees uh, Celsius for one week. This kind of simulated the summertime temperatures inside a car. And this would simulate you leaving your sports water bottle full of water in your car for about a week in the summer. Then we also had a second set of these bottles. And they were placed at room temperature for one week. With our bottled water, we did a very similar type of experiment. We had two sets of each brand. We had three different brands. And we placed one set in an oven for, at 60 degrees for one week, again, to simulate the summer temperatures. And then a second set was placed at room temperature for a week. The water was then extracted using liquid-liquid extraction. We did an acid and a base extraction. The BPA was known to be an acid extractable compound, but we did an acid and a base extraction. Uh, we took the aliquots, we combined them together, and we dried them with uh, sodium sulfate, and then we evaporated them down to one mil. We used GCMS for our analysis. Our scan range was 35 to 450 mass units and one injection on a CV5 capillary column. This is a list of our, of our targets that we were looking at. Um, the bold ones, again, are some of the targeted or the restricted phthalates. And if we look at the water samples first, there was quite a diversity in the amount of phthalates in the different types of water samples. If we look just first at the two bottled water samples, we have the HPLC water which had a very high amount of phthalates, including BPA, DEHP, all the other banned phthalates as well. Almost 100 ppb of phthalates. The LCMS water, on the other hand, was, had a very low amount of phthalates. This is why it was chosen to fill our bottles uh, for some of our other experiments. We had about 1.1 you know, uh, ppb of phthalates. For our DI water sources, we have our flushed and our stationary sources. The stationary source, the one that sat for 12 hours, had about 30 ppb of phthalates at the beginning of the morning. And after it had been flushed for a while, we had about 10 ppb of phthalates. When we look at the DI uh, bottled water that was sitting there, the phthalate levels actually were, were pretty low. They were about 5 ppb. And our municipal tap water did very well when it came to phthalates and BPA. There was no BPA in it at all. And our phthalate level was about 3 ppb. And the graphs down here are just kind of a little visual snapshot showing that the HPLC water, um, the HPLC water was the highest of the concentration of phthalates. We look at all of our consumer water sources, not the laboratory water sources, we have our three brands of room temperature bottled water. And all three of them ranged from about 4.5 to about 9 uh, ppb of total phthalate concentration, which is a very small amount of phthalate concentration at room temperature. If we look at the water sample. The water sample from the tap uh, fare a little bit better, under 5 ppb here. Uh, if we look at our flushed uh, water cooler system, again, a nice low amount of, of phthalates. Our stationary system, this, now this particular brand A stationary system uh, or point of view system, this is the one that was directly uh, linked into the municipal water and was more of a dispensing unit. Now, the, the big change comes with this brand B, which had a UV sanitization system and a carbon fiber filter. The flush system also did very well compared to uh, the bottled water, municipal tap water. But the sample that had been sitting in the system for over 12 hours had over 40 ppb of phthalates in it. If we look at exposure to heat for those bottled water samples, we really did not find any significant increase in uh, the number of phthalates or the, the concentration of phthalates when it came to the hot, uh, heated samples. 
there was a slight increase in the number of different kinds of phthalates in the, in the heated samples. Um, but in general, the, the concentrations overall were, the, the differences in concentration were, were very small. So the largest differences between the heated and the room temperature bottled water samples, there was a slight uh, number of different phthalates that increased after it was heated. Um, the butylbenzyl phthalate actually it did increase in all the heated samples. Uh, and in two out of the three of our bottled water samples, the DEHP, which is one of the controlled phthalates for toys, uh, did decrease in two out of three brands. Now, DEHP is commonly used for the liner of bottle caps, soda bottle caps, and, and other types of materials. And there was an earlier study that was uh, done that showed that the compound of DEHP in water actually did decrease in samples that were kept above 20 degrees Celsius. And they suggested it was a possible breakdown of the DEHP. If we look at the breakdown of some of the, the phthalates we did find in these bottled waters, the heated and room temperature samples, the butyl benzyl phthalate in each case did go up in the heated samples. That's the, this white gray line here. The DEHP in two of our samples did go down fairly, fairly good amount in two of our samples and basically just about stayed the same in one sample. If we look at our consumer water, the lowest concentrations were in our municipal tap sources and our point of use system, so our water coolers after they were flushed. The highest concentration came from our static point of use, our static uh, filter system that had that uh, carbon fiber filter and it had that UV sanitization system. Now, in speaking with the maintenance person who takes care of this system, I found out that the, the filter had been replaced within the week uh, that we had actually done this study. So it is quite possible that when filters and new filters are replaced in the system that this might cause some filter contamination or higher levels of phthalates while the system flushes through that new filter. The good news is that of all the consumer water sources, except for that one very high static water sample, all of our consumer water that we had had less than 10 ppb of total phthalate concentration. And the bottled water had slightly higher concentrations than municipal tap water. Municipal tap water ranged around 5 ppb, and the bottled water ranged around 10 ppb. Uh, we're talking about a small difference of about 5 parts per billion. And none of the bottled water samples or the municipal tap water actually contained BPA, which is the good news. Our point of use system, again, that system with the carbon fiber filter and that uh, UV sanitization, did have a very small amount of BPA in both the static and the flushed samples. And that ranged from 0.04 to 0.09 ppb. If we look at our sports bottles, we found that BPA was actually found in our polycarbonate sports bottles. We kind of expected it, that the polycarbonate is, no, is known to have BPA in the sample. And which was also predicted, BPA is known to leach when the water is heated. In our unrinsed sample, we did see about 0.2 uh, ppb of, of bisphenol A. And when we heated the bottle, we saw about 0.1 ppb of bisphenol A. But at the room temperature sample, we did not get leaching of BPA. We also found that there was no BPA in our BPA-free water bottles. So those people who uh, believe in paying for a BPA-free sports bottle, you are getting what you pay for if you're not looking for BPA. One of the interesting uh, findings about the BPA-free sports bottle, if we look at our unrinsed sample, we had about 10 ppb of phthalate contamination from our unrinsed sample. And after that was heated, we actually got 13. So we, our, our, I'm sorry, our wrist and heated sample actually did give us a bit more of the contamination. And then we had an old BPA-free bottle that one of our uh, employees was using. And we had heard stories that the more a, a bottle is used, the more scratches and stuff it gets on it, the more times it's put through the dishwasher, the higher the amount of phthalates and BPA you're going to get from that bottle. So we also filled that bottle and heated it. And we found about 7 um, ppb. Again, all these numbers are very close you know, or under that 10 ppb uh, range of the bottled water. <coughs> Excuse me. The other types of bottles we had were uh, a squeeze reusable bottle. Again, that's that uh, PVC material 
uh, a soft and squeezable bottle, a plastic jug type bottle, and a Teflon bottle. We found we did find BPA in our jug style bottle, again about 0.2 um, ppb, and we found it in our heated uh, FEP or Teflon style bottle. The BPA was found in the heated bottles again, not in the room temperature bottles, and we didn't find any BPA at all in the squeeze bottles. Now, for these rinses, we actually found uh, that the very first rinse out of the bottle did not have a lot of uh, free phthalates coming off of it, maybe due to the type of plastic or material that they were made out of. But the, the very first unrinsed sample was a fairly low amount, 0 0.6, 0 0.06. It was actually the room temperature samples that had the most phthalate migration from those types of plastics. This uh, particular squeeze bottle at room temperature for a week had about 42 ppb of phthalates. This particular plastic jug had about 21 ppb of phthalates at room temperature. And most of this was contributed from the, this diisobutyl phthalate. There was about 32 ppb of isobutyl phthalate in this rinsed bottle, uh, where when it was unrinsed and heated, we did not see that. And again, we saw a similar uh, effect here in this particular plastic jug sample, where there's very little in the unrinsed and the rinse, but there is about 16 uh, ppb in that sample. So what were our conclusions when it came to the lab reagents in water? Well, we did realize that phthalic contamination was definitely widespread in the laboratory, and that many of our materials did contain fairly significant amounts of phthalates when you're talking about the ppb level. The rinsing and the baking definitely reduced our phthalate levels. And we really needed to pick very carefully the type of water we were using in this experiment because there was a large variability of phthalates in the laboratory water. Our laboratory water uh, samples ranged from 1 to 91 ppb, with the lowest level being the LCMS grade water and the highest level in the LC grade water. For our bottled water, all of the bottled water was below 10 ppb of total target compounds. And we really did not find any significant differences in the, the levels of of phthalates in the different brands of water. In the heated versus wa uh, heated water bottles versus the room temperature, there was like an insignificant increase in the numbers of phthalates in the heated. There were slightly more in, uh, different types of phthalates in the heated samples. Um, and we did have a slight increase of butyl benzyl phthalate in all the heated, heated sample brands. But we also had a decrease of the, the DE HP in two out of three of our heated brands of bottled water. For our municipal water sources, the lowest concentration was our municipal tap water or our filter system or our dispensing system, I should say, after it had been flushed. And the highest co uh, concentration was in that office cooler with the, with the filter system um, right the first thing in the morning. And the levels significantly dropped off after it was flushed. So it was a, a good rule of thumb for all of us here to let the water flow in the morning before we came in and made our morning coffee, let a few, uh, a few liters of the water just kind of flow through the system just to get things cleaned out. For our sports bottles, the BPA uh, was found in the traditional polycarbonate sports bottle. And the concentration did increase a little bit after it was heated. But the overall concentration was in that unwashed bottle. The highest concentration for those sports bottles was in the unwashed bottle. And the good news is most of us actually do wash our sports bottles before we use them. The BPA-free sports bottle uh, did not contain any measurable BPA. But the heating of that BPA-free sports bottle did appear to increase the levels of other phthalates. For our other containers, we had the plastic jug and soft squeeze bottles had the highest levels of phthalates at room temperature. So if there was any concern over phthalates and keeping water at room temperature, it was in these types of bottles. And this was mostly due to the isobutyl phthalate and the DEHP. Uh, and these numbers were not as high in the heated bottles, possibly by the breakdown of these particular compounds. The Teflon bottle had a fairly consistent level of phthalates in the heated and room temperature samples. It never changed much past the you know, half a ppb level. Here's a list of the different compliance standards that uh, SPECS CertiPrep offers, including some of the ones that we've used for this study. Um, we have some of our stock phthalate standards and our phthalate mixes. We have the six restricted phthalates as an uh, QC standard. 
And when we have our new phthalates and polyethylene QC standard, which is a phthalate mix in a polyethylene matrix that can be used along with extraction procedures. And it was designed to kind of go along with the Consumer Product uh, Safety Commission method. And for anybody who's doing metal analysis, we actually do have a list of products for metal analysis for in plastic toys and for the ROE standards. For any of our references, please request them by calling us or emailing us. And you're more than welcome to request our white paper on the laboratory consumer water sources presence of BPA and phthalate. Yes, we have time for some questions now. All right. Well, uh, as, uh, as just type in any questions you might have into the question box. It looks like we don't have very many at the moment, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of time to, to go ahead and type them in, and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, while we're while you're doing that, let me just uh, get a few, few other things out of the way. Uh, at PitCon last month, we unveiled our 2011-2012 edition of our CRM catalog. It's the same split book design that that uh, let everybody find their organic or inorganic certified reference materials easily. But we updated it to include new products like our new tuning solution for ICPMS and our line of consumer safety products, including the phthalates and polyethylene standard and blank that uh, we discussed today. So you just log on to our website and request a, co a hard copy, or you can download a, a PDF version right away. And we are on social on uh, the major social social media sites, so you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. When the uh, video is posted, we're going to put it on our YouTube page so everybody will be able to see the recording of the webinar. And if uh, you like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, then uh, we're going to be giving away a free uh, mini poster of our pet food uh, presentation that we did a couple uh, months ago. So just like us or follow us and then just send us an email with your name and mailing address information and we'll be happy to send it off to you. And then also for every single one of our friends and followers, we're going to donate $2 to uh, American Forest. That's in honor of Earth Day last week. So that uh, we're going to be tallying all of the numbers up at the end of, uh, end of the week. And, oh, and oh, missing the slide. So, uh, and we're going to be giving away a uh, elements book. And um, if you've attended, oh, looks like we've got a few, uh, few questions here. So before we get to that, we'll uh, go through the questions. OK. My first question is, why does HPLC grade water have more phthalates? Um, in particular, I don't know why the HPLC grade uh, had more phthalates. We did not test other grades of bottled water. There are other grades of bottled water. Um, we did only test the two grades, the HPLC and the LCMS grade. And uh, I would believe that the LCMS grade, just by the virtue of it's made for an LCMS, which is a much more sensitive analysis, has more controls on its manufacture and filtration than the HPLC grade water does have. Um, in addition, this, we'd have to ask the manufacturer of the water if there's any uh, particular care placed into not having any additives or coatings in the bottles for the LCMS grade, which might not be of concern for an, an HPLC grade water. Another question, are you aware of any legal actions that claim adverse health effects from phthalates in any jurisdiction worldwide? That is a good question. Um, I know that in, in, in courts uh, around the world that were in scientific communities, I don't know necessarily about legal, but in scientific communities, there's a lot of uh, documentation both for and against the different phthalates and for BPA that matter. Um, there's probably a, a split, uh, you know, half and half about what they believe the, the safe levels of phthalates or BPA are, or if they're safe at all. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a legal analyst anyway, so I'm not entirely sure what legal actions might be in the courts when it regards to phthalates. I do know that uh, there are many uh, countries that have legal discussions right now of what bans, if any, should be placed on phthalates. Uh, there was some discussion here in the U.S. about uh, bisphenol A and some of the additional phthalates that have uh, been put to discussion. But right now, the expert on those panels have uh, deemed right now that there is no immediate risk for, for those particular compounds. Um, do we know of any level of phthalate to BPA in food grade glass containers? I would believe that there is possibly a, a risk of 
phthalate contamination in food grade glass containers, um, if they have some type of, of breakage coating on them, or if there is some sort of treatment to the glass that's a possibility. I don't know what the long-term uh, level of phthalates would be for some type of container like that. Uh, the, the glass itself is not manufactured with phthalates, but the, the coating. Um, just like glass jars for things that you buy food in, it's not necessarily the glass jar that has any phthalate contamination or BPA. It would be the lid that's on there, the metal lid or the plastic cap that would be on there that would have the contamination. Uh, what instruments were used in the study? We have a uh, GC mass spec. We have Hewlett Packard uh, GC mass specs, and those were the instruments that were used for this study. Is it possible to produce plastic products without any phthalates whatsoever? Well, before the um, before uh, phthalates were in widespread use in the 1930s and 20s, uh, plastics were still produced. They weren't the same form. They didn't have as much flexibility or as much function as they do now. But uh, early plastics did use other compounds for softening and strengthening them. So is it possible? I'm not a plastic chemist. I would have to defer to a plastic chemist on this. But in the past, phthalates were not used exclusively to soften, strengthen, or line plastics or create plastics. So it is possible that if an alternative found, and I know that there is a lot of study going into uh, companies that manufacture water bottles are looking for alternative phthalates, maybe ones that are not broken down in the body or ones that are not metabolized in the body to, uh, to use as plasticizers. Are there any proposed or pending FDA regulations requiring the identification or quantification of phthalates in any types of foods, drugs, etc.? Um, as far as I know, the FDA is uh, still studying phthalates. They haven't put any requirements or regulations for phthalates or for BPA. I just read an article not too long ago that phthalates I'm sorry if I misquote this because I forgot to write it down. It was either the BPA or phthalates are actually used on coding for some prescription medications, um, and they're actually used in some uh, supplements or vitamins. So uh, I'm sure that the FDA is looking into the possible exposure and uh, dosage that people would be getting from food and drugs. How do you prevent cross-contamination between grinding samples in the specs mill? Those specs have Teflon parts, special washing techniques. Um, yes, we actually do have uh, different grinding um, materials that we can use. We do have uh, metal grinding units, so there isn't any phthalate contamination. Um, last year, when we did our pet food contamination, we were concerned about metals, so we actually did have polycarbonate uh, a grinding media and, and, and grinding parts that we use there. So we, we do target what we're exactly looking for, and we try to uh, fit the, the, the parts of the, the freezer mill and the, and the Geno grinder that we're going to use to fit the experiment. So we wouldn't be using our metal parts for our metals experiment, and we don't use our polycarbonate parts for experiments for BPA or phthalates. Are there phthalates on coatings for, for papers, plastics, and paper cups? Uh, it depends on the brands, and I don't have a list of brands of which brands do have phthalates. But yes, uh, anytime there are agents to stop things from sticking together, uh, from clumping, um, uh, this, they're used as slide agents. So yes, uh, different uh, paper plastic cups. I just also read a study that some of the uh, plastic disposable cups that you use for parties actually do have uh, phthalates or a, a, some sort of BPA coating to them. So yes, it is possible. I can't say that every brand. In fact, I, I would bet there are a lot of brands that pride themselves on not using phthalates or BPA for coatings for their paper plates and paper cups. Do you have any methods for total BPA in consumer products such as toys, inks, or plastics? Well, right now, the, the methods for the BPA are the ASTM methods in wastewater. Um, we do not have a method for the, the BPA in, in plastic toys. Um, we are going to try to uh, use the similar methods uh, that the Consumer Product Safety Commission is using for phthalates in order to try to, to get the, the BPA analysis for our toy study. And our toy study is just starting out, so we'll have more to report about that once it's, once it's fully underway and uh, we have some results. Why was the target level set at the study at 10 ppb? There was no target level set at 10 ppb for this study. It just happened that the samples that we tested, the majority of them were 
under 50 pp under 50 ppb. Um, there wasn't, like I said, no target level set for the study. We did run a series of standards at different concentrations, so we would have a uh, you know a calibration curve, and it happened that our water samples were not particularly high in in phthalates or or BPA. Uh, is there any cause for concern for phthalate levels in contact lenses? That is a good question. If I was a contact lens wearer, I'd be reading the box of my contact lenses a little more closely. Excuse me. Um, usually, it's a, not the exposure of one particular phthalate that we need to be concerned about. It's the total uh, cumulative exposure to your phthalate levels. And should you be concerned on your exposure from contact lenses? Absolutely. You need to take a look at uh, what other your potential exposure routes? It's like any other toxic exposure, whether it be from metals and mercury or phthalates from plastic. Uh, if you're wearing cosmetics and wearing perfume, you've just now increased your exposure level of phthalates. If you're wearing contact lenses, you've increased your level. And there is a level of, uh, I had quoted it before, I think it was 50 micrograms per kilogram per day that the EPA suggests as a, a dosage level that we should not exceed. Uh, if you go through all your sources and can you know, roughly calculate what your exposure levels from all these different sources are, if all those together is over 50 micrograms per kilogram of your body weight per day, then you should probably be concerned of where those sources are and which ones you could cut out of your life. But that's a personal decision that you have to basically take a look at uh, what can you get rid of in your life that might be exposing you to extra BPA and phthalates. Uh, I don't think there's any one source that's been targeted as the ultimate source of exposure for us to phthalates or BPA. Uh, okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question here. So okay. Let's see. Why might have DEHP and BVP been detected at higher level concentrations than other target phthalate uh, compounds in your study? Uh, well, DEHP was detected um, more in the room temperature uh, samples than the higher temperature samples, suggesting uh, in previous studies they said the same thing, that the heating of the water actually degrades the DEHP. And DEHP and butyl benzyl phthalate, uh, up until the past two years, have been incredibly common uh, plasticizers. The DEHP, as I said during the talk, if you open up a bottle of water that you've just taken out of the dispenser and you look inside the cap of the bottle's water, there is a like a rubbery kind of area inside the cap, that seal, and that seal does have a significant amount of DEHP. So there, it has been in, in very widespread use. So DEHP and butyl benzyl phthalate has been in widespread use uh, in a lot of plastic compounds. So it, it wouldn't be surprising if those are two of the more um, higher concentration uh, phthalates in, in some of the samples. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Those are great questions. I guess that's about it. So thank you, Patty, once again, for giving a great presentation. As a reminder, we'll be sending everyone a copy of the presentation slides, and a recording of the webinar will be posted uh, in about a week or so. Anyone interested in our previous webinars, including trace metals and pet food, chemical gourmet, or clean lab techniques, can see on-demand versions of them on our YouTube channel. It's at youtube.com slash prep. And uh, be sure to visit our new website at uh, specsertaprep.com. And I would like to thank everybody for attending today. And we look forward to seeing you again in a future webinar. Thank you.